So in the book, I talk about three skills, um, shift, approach, and align. And we start upstream from that. The first thing we have to all be willing to do to live a bold life is to lean into discomfort a little bit. And it doesn't have to be publicly like you and I just did, but like sit with yourself, look at the last two weeks of your life and ask yourself, just look at your calendar and ask yourself, am I living my best life? Am I doing the things I really want to be doing? And if I'm not, what's getting in the way? In other words, where am I avoiding? Hey friends, welcome to the Good Life Podcast, a show for women in midlife who want to live happier, healthier, and more meaningful lives. I'm Michelle Lamoureux, self-love and podcast coach, as well as the author of Design a Life You Love. And together, we're going to be doing just that. Each week, I bring on world-class experts, authors, entrepreneurs, and also do solo casts with the intention of giving you the time and space to think about what you really desire in your life. I'm so glad that you're here. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to learn how to turn our anxiety into strength with Harvard-based psychotherapist, Dr. Luana Marquise, her three-step method to living boldly. It's a clinically proven approach that inspires patients from CEOs to at-risk teens and echoes lessons learned from growing up in poverty in Brazil. Dr. Luana Marques is an associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, past president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, and the author of Bold Move, a three-step plan to transform anxiety into power. Informed by her personal journey in two decades as professor and researcher at Harvard Medical School, she coaches individuals to live their best lives by rewiring the way they think, feel, and behave. Welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm so um, honored to be here with you today. Oh, I'm excited to jump into your book with you. I um, loved reading it. I felt like I got a sense of who you are. And one of the things that I truly appreciated was you think, oh, you must have it, like never make mistakes, never have anxiety. And you're very transparent in the book that you're also on your own journey, even with the tools that you can go back to. And so we're very lucky to be learning from you because we don't have those tools. We get stuck in loops, don't we? (laughs) We we do, we do. I really wanted people to understand that, you know, I think about the book and the skills as like going to the gym. If you stop going to the gym, then you lose your skills. And so, you know, anxiety is part of life. We can't get rid of anxiety. And I talk a lot in the book about my own anxiety journey and understanding how to to transform into power and knowing that's going to be there with me. Yeah, it's definitely, it seems like it's a huge problem though. I had a doctor on the show probably almost, maybe it was 2020. And she had come on during COVID and she had said that before COVID even hit, we were having and like just sky high numbers, like record numbers of like anxiety being like number one problem. And she said that was before COVID hit. So what are you seeing, especially now that we're coming out of it? What, What can you tell us about where we are with anxiety? Yeah, I mean, so the data are, um, stunning. If you look at the CDC data before COVID, about, you know, 10 to 20% of the U.S. population struggled with some level of anxiety. Since the pandemic, that number has been between 30 and 40%. It nearly double the number of people that are suffering clinical levels of depression and anxiety. And what I've seen is, is that it's not that people didn't have anxiety before, is that now the tools that people had that helped them to manage their anxiety, those tools are no longer working as much as they did before. Mm. So now I have high school teachers calling me and saying, Luana, I could handle the students before, but now I just have to walk out of the room because I feel like I'm going to blow up with them. Or, you know, a surgeon come to me and say, I always manage so well, but now The only thing I can manage the operating room when I'm home with my kids, my anxiety is so high that I can't be present and I'm escalating and yelling in them. Mm. And so it's like hitting every socioeconomic status and it's hitting people just in a way that they feel like they're missing a way to handle it. Yeah. 
Is that why you wrote the book? Did you want to serve all these people or what, what prompted, you know, you to decide to write it now? Two things. Um, one was that for the last 10 years of my research has been getting out of the ivory tower and really translating cognitive behavior therapy into skills that yeah. could be used in inner city. So with inner city youth mostly. Mm. And so for 10 years, I've been making this little dent there and feeling like, okay, we are moving the needle a little bit. Organizations are learning this. But then the pandemic hit and I saw that like the world crying for more skills. And I felt like I had a calling to really impact the world in a way that we could make, you know, the skills accessible to all, not just a community organization I was working with. Yes. And so it's this, this, this translation for me of a value of like ambition and pulling my, pushing my career to really focusing more on impact. Mm. And then to share, to share with you, Michelle, at a personal level, I myself hit a wall. It was mm. a moment for me in the beginning of COVID that I was like, what I'm doing is no longer working. Like the things that brought me joy before no longer brought me joy, mm. but I kept doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And, and it wasn't working. And so I had a particular moment at work that I was like, this is not working anymore. So I had to really pause and reevaluate my life and think about what is the next 10 years of my career? Where do I want to put my energy? And that's where the book came in. It was like, I want to, I want to write this book. I want to share my true story for the world. I want to yeah. talk about, you know, the vulnerable me and the power for me, the one that is starved and the one that's doing well today in the hopes of really bringing skills to as many people as possible globally. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you did do it. And your story is a beautiful one. It is one of, you know, like a, a the success story that somebody can look to as a roadmap, like, you know, what's possible. And actually I'd love to start because you opened the book explaining a little bit about your background and the anxiety that you faced uh, growing up in poverty in Brazil and um, would you be, could you, could we start there? I'd love to just have you tell it versus me translate what I, what I took from it. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing is as, as an adult, I've treated anxiety for 20 years and patients would ask me, you know, have you ever had a panic attack? Were you anxious as a kid? And I'd be like, no, I'm not anxious. It took like a lot of soul searching to understand what I really went through. And, and, you know, I say this in the book, my parents are incredible people. We're incredible people. Um, but you know, they had my sister and I at 20 and they didn't have the tools or the financial stability to handle two kids. My father did a lot of drugs and alcohol and, and there was a lot of domestic violence in our family. And by the age I was about 10, my father was out of the picture, which probably was the best thing that could have happened to our family at, you know, in hindsight, but at 10, it was yeah. really challenging seeing yeah. my mom have three jobs to feed us feeling like if I had worked harder or had done more, perhaps they'd be together, that somehow I could save them out of this um, anxiety. And so I grew up as a very anxious kid and and probably had I not had, you know, a few breaks along the way, had stayed in Brazil and had repeat the same story because that's what we see. Yeah. You know, I, I've done so much work on trauma now and, and, and I'm a trauma therapist. And what you see is that the trauma just repeats in generations. And yeah. thankfully I was able to break it out of that. Yeah, you broke the cycle for the next generations. I believe that we heal not just ourselves, but the lineage and then the future. Like we make way for the future. Like it's like a a line that just transcends the past and then where we're going. Like that your healing actually heals on an energetic level your ancestors. I think you're very right. I mean, I was just with my mom on Mother's Day and we had a very honest conversation about what she went through, which, you know, today she can go there. And I think she said herself, seeing me do so well calms her down and makes her feel like she um, she helped us, help me get there. But also like that I didn't repeat it, that I'm in a stable, very loving marriage, that I am able to pursue my dreams and not be scared of it. And so I could see that healing happening to her. Yeah. So I think you're right. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so beautiful. And let's talk about anxiety, because I think we can say, oh, I'm feeling anxious or you're, you know, that person's got anxiety or your friend might say, I have anxiety. 
from a clinical standpoint, what is anxiety and how does it differ from depression? So great question. Um, so really, anxiety has many components. And so I think the best way to explain about anxiety is whenever people talk about I'm anxious, right? They are feeling some level of discomfort and it, it tends to play out either in what they're saying to themselves, yeah. how they feel in their bodies or what they do. So I've worked with people who are anxiety is really about their thinking. And it looks something like this. What if I don't get that job? What if I can't go on that date? What if? And the what if is usually a catastrophe about the future. Yes. And, right? And they're yes. stuck on this what if. Yeah. And the more we feed our brain that what if, yeah. the more we start to feel anxious. And that's where some people, you know, stay on the what if. Some people, their heart pounds, they start to sweat, they have tingling sensations. They just feel like uncomfortable in their physical body. So there's this yes. biological component of anxiety. And then there are people that hate anxiety so much that to not feel either the feelings or to, to avoid the thoughts, they just avoid anything that makes them anxious. So I've worked with people that won't, you know, go on roller coasters or go on a plane for that matter. Or even, you know, in the extreme case, I've had patients that like really want a family, but are so terrified of dating that they won't go on a date. Wow. And so they're not anxious. They'll come to me and say, I'm not anxious. I said, okay, <laughs> but what if you were to go on a date and they go, well, that would make me anxious, but like right now I'm not anxious. <laughs> they're just avoiding, which we'll get into. Yes. Right. That's exactly right. And so that's how I think about anxiety. It's like, a situation happen and yeah. it affects our thoughts, emotions, and our behaviors. And for each one of us, it looks different. I, you know, when I get anxious for me, a lot of it is physiologically. I woke up this morning and I have this book coming out, coming out on a weekend. The first thing that had my heart was pounding and my brain went, oh my God, the book is going to tank. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> like, I don't know, I hear that, but my brain was just spinning a little bit. Yes. And each one of us just have a different flavor of anxiety a little bit. Yeah. What if it's chronic? So when you were little and managing so much, right? And then you felt like you were you were helping to take care of your sister and you know, you were doing so much as well. And then also I think when we're kids, we feel some sense of responsibility if we see our parents, you know, in these hard situations, even though we don't necessarily have the tools for them. There's maybe a sense of over responsibility that develops, right? Or like different parts of our character yes. develop as a result of that. So if it's chronic. Is that more, is that still anxiety or is that like hypervigilance? Is that like, like a, a spectrum of anxiety, for example, like could somebody yeah. like, is that still within anxiety mm -hmm. or is that something a little different? I'm always just curious about this. And, and I just realized that I didn't separate anxiety from depression. You asked that beautiful question and I gave you all about anxiety, but so let's, you know, we use a lot of terms um, as psychologists, but it, it is always a spectrum. It's a spectrum yes. from like mild to moderate to severe. Yeah. And spectrum has a lot of relationships. For example, you were asked about depression. Anxiety is the one that you feel like you're hyper a little bit and you're thinking about thinking. Depression is when you have trouble sleeping, you have difficulty concentrating, um, you find yourself sometimes sleeping too much or not enough. Um, and the person on a depression spectrum tend to say things like, I just feel like I'm carrying a hundred kilos of potatoes on my back and I just, yeah. I'm dragging my body aches, right? So the sense of heaviness that comes with depression versus anxiety when you're hyper. And so where this hypervigilance comes in, that term comes from when we're talking more about a traumatic experience, like I described in my childhood, that was extremely yeah. traumatic. Yes. And I honestly did not understand that domestic violence was trauma until I was in graduate school. Wow. And within the culture in Brazil, Michelle, it's just accepted. It is mm. what men do to women. And it's still the case, by the way. Wow. I had a, a friend of mine say that her brother's in, brother in law, like, really somebody up and she was devastated. She's, you know, somebody that really doesn't believe in this stuff. And, and she called me to talk about it because at the emergency room, the doctor never even asked the question. It was like the doctor themselves didn't wow. want to acknowledge it. Oh, wow. And so, and so to your point, hypervigilance happens when you have especially chronic childhood trauma. trauma. And, and to this day, I am probably a little more on the hyper vigilant aspect than most people that never had trauma because that part of my brain had to be on as a kid when yes. somebody else's brain didn't have to. Yeah. To keep you safe. 
It was it right? And it was it to keep that's asleep? exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Because any noise could indicate a big incident, and that incident could lead to something really bad. And so um, we know scientifically now that kids that have early childhood adverse events like I did, yeah, things like divorce, domestic violence, substance use in the home, any of those things, um, they have overdeveloped amygdalas. They have overdeveloped fear response. And it works when you're a kid. It's not very adaptive as an adult. And But thankfully, there's great treatment and people can get better. Yeah. And we're going to unpack some of the tools that you have in your book as well, as as a, as a roadmap as well. You know, I, I guess as you were talking, I was thinking about... Um, of teens and stuff and, and the rates of it. And I had read that, because I have a teenager, I have a 14 year old that, and please correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, so they, their prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop until they're like 24 or 25. So when they have like emotional outbursts, it's because they're operating from the amygdala, but that also happens to adults. It sounds like if I'm understanding what you just said, who didn't have those coping skills. And even though the prefrontal cortex should have taken priority, there's still maybe more of the fight or flight. Am I just, am I making this up or did, am I getting this? No, you, you're not making it up at all. So, okay. you know, the data, the data today is closer to 30. So that the prefrontal cortex oh, is wow. not fully, fully developed to 30. Um, and, and the interesting thing here is the prefrontal cortex is the organizational part of the brain, is the planning part of the brain, right? Is the logical yeah. thinking part of the brain. And it functions a bit of a, as a break for us. So when the Fear, fear network goes on, the prefrontal cortex has the ability to override it, but it has to be fully developed. Okay. So when a 14 year old is acting erratic or can't calm down, it's because they really, really can't, right? <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing is we also know from neuroscience that we can't train a 14 year old to activate the prefrontal cortex. So we can or cannot? Breaks, I, can, we can. We can. We can. So their brakes are not fully developed, but like you can teach them. In fact, as early as four or five, I, I have a five-year-old at home and we, the way we talk about this is, you know, there's his emotional brain. I touched the back of my brain. There's his thinking brain, the front. And I can tell you a couple of days ago, he like was in a temper tantrum and he goes to me and he goes, I'm out of my emotional brain and you can't get me out of here. And I said, so you're right, Diego. I can't. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Yeah, only you have that ability. So I said, let's just sit and wait a moment. And he was really mad for a while. And then I said, okay, what is one thing we could do to turn on your thinking brain? And eventually he went for self-soothing. Like it's a lot of conversations to that we have to just teach him the basics. Because I actually think there's a lot of power just in the basics that you actually have some control over your brain. Like if, if there's still a little bit of the prefrontal cortex on, we can get it back online. That's so interesting. And I didn't realize it was 30. If you think about the consequences of that to some degree, and, you know, maybe some of the decision-making that's happening, it makes sense. And then, you know, you feel like in your thirties, you do feel a little bit more in control. And I don't know, I, 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 the difference between the twenties and thirties, hundred percent. Yeah. hundred it, percent. You know, it's so it's so funny because in your twenties, you think you've got it and you're like, you know, there's a superpower and you can do anything. And then you to your 30s and you go, wow, there's so much I didn't know. <laughs> and I think <laughs> it's so because funny. the proof of the cortex is there. And you're like, wow. <laughs> it helps you navigate more and maybe get more in control. Well, you write in your book, you write, um, and this is about one of the things you alluded to before, which is the desire to avoid the emotions, which you say is obviously not the way to help yourself. You write, after all, to live boldly does not mean to live fearlessly or recklessly, but to face life's challenges without being paralyzed by psychological avoidance, the real enemy that most of us face. So unpack that for us, and maybe you can give an example from the book. Absolutely. So, you know, most of the people I've worked with in my life um, have come to me and said, get rid of my anxiety. Yeah. If the anxiety is gone, I can thrive. And getting rid of somebody's anxiety is like getting rid of somebody's pain receptors, right? And we need those pain receptors. If you touch a hot stove, you want to know it's hot. Otherwise, yeah. you have some serious burns. Yeah. And so anxiety, although uncomfortable, is not really the problem. The real infection is what we do when we are anxious. So let me give you a personal example. 
When I was 15, I moved from Governador Valadares to Belo Horizonte. My mom sent me to live with my grandmother at a bigger city for a better education with the idea that perhaps that education would get me into college and then perhaps my life would be better. And so I went from this network of feeling safe with my mom and my sister to this huge town and having to walk to school and learning new things and learning new people and not having my friends and my brain pretty much decided that people are scary and no one was going to like me. Mm. And so I hyper-focused on studies because that was the message I get. If you study, you're going to get out of where you were at. Yes. And my grandmother looked at me and said, why aren't your friends coming over? And I'd answer with, well, I need to study more. But why haven't you made any friends? You had to a lot of friends in your small town. And I kept just avoiding it. And what I was avoiding was this discomfort that I was perhaps awkward. I was a small town girl in a big town. And eventually my grandmother, um, being a very wise person, dragged me to the mall um, in the emptus that we we're going to have Chinese food. And I was so excited. I had never had Chinese food. And the minute we got the food, she looked at me and says, let's go sit and talk to that older gentleman. And Michelle, I have to tell you, like to this day, I tell the story after it. And it's like, I still get a little pet on my stomach. And I know today I do keynotes in public speaking, but I remember the 15 year old me and what my brain said. It just said people are scary. Oh. Right. And had my grandmother not intervened, I would have continued to avoid because avoidance works momentarily. Yeah. Right? Being home sure. studying made me feel momentarily better. It's just the cost is so high long-term. Yeah. And if I took that that 15-year-old me and took my grandma out of their picture and just used science to predict what we know is a kid like that, it's very likely to develop what's called social phobia. Mm. And individual social phobia makes you know, less income. They have less quality of life. They never pursue their full potential because they spend their whole life avoiding people. And so that is the argument I make in, in the book is that, yes, anxiety sucks. I don't like it either, right? But what really gets us stuck is not anxiety, it's what we do when we're anxious. And if all we do is get a quick fix to run away from this comfort, we stay really stuck. Yeah, that's such a good story. Well, okay, so it made me think of a couple of different things. Can anxiety itself be a way to avoid? Meaning you get in the pattern of looping. And so you keep yourself, maybe that's still avoidance, but you're looping. And so by staying in these either catastrophizing, the, doing the worst case scenarios, you're still just in your head and you're not fully engaged because even though it's uncomfortable, you're still somewhat in control, even though it feels totally out of control. Does, yes? That is a beautiful description of a person that reacts to avoid. So is the person that they get anxious and then they do something, they go towards the anxiety. That was me 10 years ago. Like the more anxious one year, I was so anxious about being at Harvard and my postdoc and I was good enough to be at Harvard that I literally published nine papers in one year. Now, there's no reason <laughs> for this. <laughs> so. <laughs> Like my friends would go to the pub to the pub on Friday night, and I would be like sitting there writing papers like a maniac because I was so terrified I didn't belong that I just reacted and avoided my own emotions. And when that year ended, here I was alone, not in a relationship, miserable, and going, "Why did I do that?" It's when I was like, "Oh my God, that's just avoidance. That's what I was doing. I was avoiding by being overproductive." It's just a flavor of avoidance. Okay. Okay. So that I think it's important for people to hear. You can use your own anxiety to continue to avoid because even though it's uncomfortable, it, it's in theory, there's a part of you that feels like it's protecting you because you're just within yourself. Yes. You're not engaged. That okay. So you say we have a superpower. What is that? Pausing. Our superpower is actually our ability to take back our brain and take control of it. And this is what I mean. In the moments like you and I've been talking about, Michelle, those moments where the amygdala, right, the emotional brain kicks on, we very likely try to do something to avoid. We're very likely going to kick into avoidance because we're biologically wired to avoid yeah. discomfort, right? The yeah. brain is thinking there's something wrong. Yeah. And the way I activate my superpower is really by moments that my temperature go high, 
I literally will pull up a piece of paper and I'll write down, what am I saying to myself? What are my thoughts? What are my emotions? Linking thoughts to emotions and what do I want to do? Mm. And the reason writing helps is to write, you have to activate your thinking brain. And they compete for energy in your brain. So when you're on full fight or flight, you can't think logically. And when you're solving a calculus problem, you're not in your emotional problem brain. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're in your emotional brain, to hit a pause, really spending some time even writing down what you're saying to yourself can be really liberating because it creates a little gap between emotion and reaction. Does yeah. that track for you? Does that make 100%, sense? hundred percent. Cause I did it literally two days ago. Cause I, there's a particular pattern that keeps showing up. And I was like, I, you know, I'm 52 now. There's something that does happen. I think in your fifties too, where you start caring less. So I don't know if mm -hmm. that's another development in the brain or just the l less estrogen or whatever's happening. It's a positive. It didn't kick in literally until 52. It didn't even happen at 50. You know, I heard Gwyneth Paltrow mm -hmm. in an interview say at 40, she just like didn't care anymore. I was like, no, that didn't happen for me at 40. <laughs> and it didn't happen at 50. It happened at 52. But there's a pattern I keep bumping up against. And I thought, what is the core? Like, what is the core wound here? Mm -hmm. Why am I still so hooked into it? And like, I feel like I revert back to a 15 year old in terms of my emotional ability to manage. And what I'm aware of is that I'm not showing up as me, I'm showing up as the part of me that I feel like I need to be in order to be in a relationship with this dynamic, with this other person, these kinds of people. So I was like, what is this? So I did write down and it does help. It's so it totally tracks for me. Totally tracks. I haven't, so I haven't unhooked yet though. I'm not quite mm -hmm. there. I'm not quite there. Well, so, you know, do you want to talk about it or do you yeah, want to we can. We can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about I it. I would love to hear. Tell me a little bit about that pattern. Let's, All right. So, so I'm going to okay. get transparent. My, my audience knows I've been sharing more. I've been doing these Monday musings with them a little bit more transparent about my own vulnerabilities. Okay. So when my, my daughter was born premature and she was in the mm -hmm. hospital and there was a really kind of cruel nurse there who was, she called me a worrier and like, wouldn't take me seriously. And the doctor saw her sort of behaving badly to me, but didn't say anything. And you're a first time mom and the baby's, you know, not coming home with you. It's just, you know, it's not ideal. Very scary. Yeah. Very scary. So I think that my intellectual side was like, well, I guess I need to be more prepared and I need more knowledge. And so when I would deal with the pediatricians when I was younger, and I'm just a generally curious person, I would mm -hmm. ask a ton of questions and I wanted to make sure I'm not going to miss anything. And I, um, I got labeled by a pediatrician, like something not very kind. And I, I internalized that. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm not trusting myself. And I was trusting her. And so I felt shame for not trusting myself and putting all my power and like giving her the power and then having her sort of label me and make me feel mm -hmm. bad about myself. And my mothering is one of the things I'm most proud of. I'm very proud of yeah, how I mother. I can see that. And I also culturally have some patterns that she doesn't understand the way that I pattern is some of it's just cultural. We Middle mm -hmm. East a little bit more like lovey, like, you know, we're not going to let the baby cry it out kind of thing. It's a different way. Like yep, I'm with you. So it's a stance and I don't, and I'm still this is what I was journaling mm -hmm. about. I'm like, I can't keep doing this because it's not going to benefit her. And it's definitely not making me feel good about me as a 52 year old, very intelligent, capable woman. Right. So that's. And I, no, absolutely. It sounds like what I hear you saying is this. And, and let me share this. My son was in the NICU uh, for a little bit too. So I get that feeling. There's yeah. nothing. It's just very challenging. And so, but it sounds to me like across all those scenarios, they are saying something to you. And I'm not even sure what they said, actually, but you've made an interpretation about what that means about you. And what is it that when you show up, yeah. like, what it is that you're saying? What is yeah. it? I'm not competent. I'm, I, there's shame. Uh huh. There's shame. And I don't know what's yeah. underneath the shame, but there's shame there. There's like, so part of it is you're different. If you were, and if you're, if you're, yeah, it's you're, if you're different. different than what? Yeah. So if I'm different than, um, yeah, maybe it goes back to yours. I'm not good enough. 
I'm not good enough. And if you're not good enough, then what happens? I'm unlovable. I'm unlovable. Yeah. Uh, that That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. See, and and if loving, if parenting and being a mother is the most important of your values and you're showing up as a mother and your brain saying, I'm unlovable, the two don't track. And so it's probably very painful. Yeah, it's painful. And so, and I feel that's why I feel the shame because I'm like, wait a second. I, what is this need for the external validation? What is this need to be liked? It's not really about, that's not really the relationship. It's really mm -hmm. about, is she getting the care she needs? And how do I show but up see, and ask the questions without him thinking I'm not trusting his authority? Like it's some authority yeah. stuff in there too. Yeah. But see what happens, Michelle. In fact, can I lean on this for a minute? Yeah, go for is it. it okay? <laughs> yeah, my audience is getting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, go for um, it. So, so the thing is this, you know, the belief is I'm unlovable and, and, you know, I'm sure you can track where that came from in your history, but what's maintaining the shame is not that belief. What maintains shame for most of us is the narrative that we make in those situations. You know, if I don't trust him, then this, if he doesn't believe I trust him, then this, and then it all gets filtered through those lenses of like, I'm unlovable. And so you're showing up being super loving so that, you know, you can make yourself feel lovable. But here's the trick. I just got to know you and lovable just the way you are. Thank you. It doesn't matter what the pediatrician says. It doesn't matter what the mean nurse says. What matters is when you show up there the next time, what I want you to do is before you walk in, just close your eyes and just really activate all your love as a mother. Hmm. And go opposite to what you're doing right now. Literally opposite. <laughs> just, just sit there. And, and I'm not saying be rude. I am not yeah, saying yeah. that. But, you know, just literally just say, there are three questions I need to ask you about this because the outcome is not what we're expecting. And you're going to feel so uncomfortable. But to that discomfort is going to train your brain, Michelle, that you don't have to be super loving to be lovable. Mm. Yeah. So good. You're so good. Now my audience is getting more insight into me, which is totally fine because I think sharing vulnerabilities and, you know, this idea that I host a show. And so that means I have the answers or I'm a coach. We're all in a process with our stuff. We all have stuff, layers and layers of yeah. stuff, right? Well, and honestly, I feel so much more connected to you by just having this moment with you. And, you know, you, you talked about your audience as women in their midlifes who want to live bold lives. And, and the first step on that is for us to sort of clean up what's behind the curtain. And we all have it. I, yeah. I talk about this in my book. I grew up feeling like I'm not enough. Mm. And to this day, I have to work on this. Like every, especially as I get closer to this book launch, my brain is screaming, like mm -hmm. it's screaming, like that people are going to hate it, that I'm not going to be successful, that my career is ruined. And it's all trying, this to, let me give you an example for your audience so that you're not the only one sharing vulnerability. <laughs> Yesterday, I did a webinar for Harvard Online with another colleague of mine. Um, Michael Pute. And Michael has a course online at Harvard and I have a course that will release in a month. And yesterday morning in preparation for the meeting, I looked at his course online. I looked at mine first and there was 8,000 people signed up. The course launch is in the end of June. I was like, wow, that's amazing. 8,000 people. That is amazing. Then, right? I thought that was amazing. That's amazing. But then I looked, I looked at Michael and, and his course had 100,000 people signed up. And I was like, oh my God, I'm such a failure. I can't believe this. I don't belong to Harvard. Like, and it, it took a millisecond, Michelle. And I went from like, oh my God, I'm superwoman to like, I'm no one. And so I'm observing this happening. Mid-afternoon, I'm talking to my colleague at Harvard who's put in the course. And I said, you know, I thought we were doing well, but we're doing horrible. Like our course only has 8,000. <laughs> she looks at me and says, Luana, his course launched a year ago. I was like, oh, it wasn't yesterday. She's like, no, that was the relaunch of it. And I was like, my damn brain, you want me to prove I'm not enough. And you created this narrative that made no sense. Yes. Right. But if I hadn't verbalized this to my colleague, I would have gotten to that webinar yesterday so anxious that I wouldn't have been able to perform. Wow. 
And so, yes. right, because my brain had a narrative. He's better than I am. The brain wanted to confirm I wasn't enough. Yes. And so I, it looked I proof. then used this, mm-hmm. it did, 100%. And if you're like a sensitive person, like emotionally read people, then you, I, I've learned that you can be right that you're reading something, but I've learned that I'm not always reading correctly. That I'm is aware. Correct. So once, yes, yes, that is correct. Once those lenses are activated and you know that these interactions with doctors activate your I'm unlovable lenses, then you're no longer accurate. Like it's like you're walking in with magnifying glasses to only find proof of that belief, even yes. though you weren't even thinking about that belief, but the brain's pretty smart. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think, you know, for the women listening, there's probably a situation that you have where you're looking for proof to confirm this negative belief and you can be doing the same thing and, you know, taking taking a step back and really getting some clarity around what's really going on. I literally said to my, I've known my one of my friends since we were 12. I'm like, I've got to unhook from this one. This is sort of not the last, but it feels kind of like the last. It's an older pattern and it's time to go. Like it's not serving me. So each opportunity, each situation, scenario, as uncomfortable as it is, I look as it, at it also as an opportunity. Right. It really is. And and I'm with you as we get older, that has been my experience as well, that you can sort of like identify the like pretzels in our brains that are keeping us stuck. And I love your word. You've said it several times. I really like this idea of unhooking it. Like this one needs to go. Right. And, yeah. and you're right. Every opportunity, every situation is an opportunity for you to unhook it a little bit at a time. Yeah. And I will also say to you that as part of what I do, I interview so many nonfiction authors and who write books to teach. Yours is beautiful. Yours is real. I felt you in every page. I was like, oh, I'm really getting a sense of who this woman is. I really like her. I like her, well, thank you. your strength and your vulnerability in the book. So I'm going to tell you that. And the stories you share are really interesting. Like I wanted to learn more about Jake. Was it Jake? Like what happened to Jake, the CEO? <laughs> Did he unhook from his anxiety or not? You know, so we can see, you could see yourself in all of these different people in different ways. You know, there was just, there was, and you again, sharing your own vulnerability throughout. And it's like, okay, it's like, we're not meant to be perfect every day. This is a, this is a journey of really learning to love ourselves and, and find that peace within. Um, uh, there's so much more I want to ask. And so I'm just going to be mindful of the time too. Okay. So um, uh, let me just take a second. Cause I just want to really think about where to go because there is so much, I, I think people are going to want tools. I know that, you know, I've done work on myself over the years. I think, you know, that's part of our, for me, it was an important part of the journey you know, to like Mm -hmm. unpack, not be stuck in patterns, not, you know, to do what I can to be as aware as I can, knowing that there's always more work to do. But some of us haven't had that opportunity, whether financially or just they're afraid to look at themselves. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are like, let's, let's walk them through a couple of steps that they can do. So let's say somebody truly Mm -hmm. is anxious. They're not getting out there. They're afraid whatever it is, friendships, looking for a new job, whatever the, the, the voice is that is looping in their mind, what's, what, where can they start? So in the book, I talk about three skills, um, shift approach and align. And, you know, we start upstream from that. The first thing we have to all be willing to do to live a bold life is to lean into discomfort a little bit. And it doesn't have to be publicly like you and I just did, but like sit with yourself, look at the last two weeks of your life and ask yourself, just look at your calendar and ask yourself, am I living my best life? Am I doing the things I really want to be doing? And if I'm not, what's getting the way? In other words, where am I avoiding? Right. Was there a situation that you really wanted to do something? Ask for a raise, you know, go throw your head in for a promotion, change careers. I've had so many women reach out now because they want to transition so much, but they're so terrified of, of what's next. And so the first step before you add skills is you have to get naked with yourself a little bit. 
And, and to me is identify avoidance patterns. Because if we can't smell the avoidance, it's really hard to figure out where to go. Yeah. Right. And so that's the first step. And then, you know, in a nutshell, the three skills are really designed to affect the three domains of anxiety. So if you're stuck on the what ifs, right, my suggestion is to shift perspective, going from this black and white catastrophic to more balanced views of ourselves. What do I mean by that? You know, it was sort of what it took me yesterday when I was talking to my colleague at Harvard. When I was talking to Nicole, I was like, okay, my brain was like, well, you don't really have to ask the question. I was like, I need to be able to tolerate this conference. Just ask the question and, and you know, and, and speak to myself as if I'm my own best friend. Mm. And in this course, I'm doing the best I can. And I don't know if you noticed this, Michelle, but we talk to our friends so kind. Even if we're direct and loving, we're so kind. Yes. We don't do the same to ourselves. Yes. Right. Yes. And so like, it's the first really skill in the book is understanding why your brain gets stuck and how to shift that perspective. And then I really talk about this idea that you need to approach instead of avoiding by going opposite action. This is what I mean. Anxiety demands that we avoid. If you're mm -hmm. anxious about asking for a raise, you postpone it and you postpone it. If you're anxious about changing careers, you rationalize about it. Opposite action is what is one step I can take towards discomfort? So instead of running away from an anxiety, how do I lean into that anxiety? And then finally, it's really aligning daily life's actions with our values. You know, values are the things that matter the most. I mean, I, the minute you're talking about mothering, I could just sense like you're, you're so proud of it. I could see yeah. how important it was. Yes. And the, the reason the scenario upset you so much is because it violates a core value for you. Yes. 100%. See, if, if it, if it wasn't related to it, you'd be like, I don't care. True. Right. True. And so it's really leaning into the pain and understanding what that can that pain can show us in such a way that we can realign our lives with our values. Yeah. And there's list you have it in some in the book, some of the most common ones in the book, right? So people can yeah, look so at I have that. a list of values. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But so can, we do can, have one. Yes. Or should people just ask themselves, like, what's a good way to approach getting clear about those values? Because I agree with you that it's so true. And if something triggers you so much, perhaps it is aligning with a core value of yours. And that's why you're so upset or thrown off by it. So, you know, most books have a list of values, mine does as well. But what we know scientifically is if you really want to understand what matters most, one of the best ways is actually to look at a pain. And that ask what? yourself look at what? I'm sorry. At the, at, at pain, at pain, a pain, at the a emotional pain. pain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And ask yourself, what would I have to not care about for this not to hurt? So mm -hmm. in your case with your daughter, you would have to not care about mothering at all for this <laughs> not to hurt. Not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. Right. And so like. Another way to say this is why is this hurting so much? And yes. very likely is because it's violating a core value. And so if you ask the question, then look at a list of values, you're likely to uncover the values that you need to have more in your life, that you need to align more with. And that really leads to such a more fulfilling life. Yes. And that's really at the heart of what we're talking about today. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything I didn't ask that you want to make sure you leave the women with today, listening with today? If there's anything you didn't ask, I think the only thing I want to share with everyone listening to us today is that, you know, your true strength is in, on that vulnerability and that finding your values and aligning life can really lead to this bold life. And it's not without anxiety. It's not without stress. It's not without shame. But it's um, within that power within each one of us. And yeah. you just demonstrated it today, Michelle. And, and I'm so thankful you, you were willing to go there with me. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I, yeah, it was unexpected, but that's how it's supposed to be. This is, like I said, it's going to be a conversation. We're going to let it flow naturally. So thank you for your curiosity and helping me. Um, hopefully I will be unhooking from this pattern now that I have more clarity around why it's happening. Um, 
where do you like people to find you online who want to learn more about you and your work? Where should I direct them? So you can um, find me on my website, www.drluana.com. Um, and I'm um, specifically drluana.com backslash book. That's where you can find out more about the book. Yes. Um, and on social media, I'm Dr. Luana Mahkis. So my phone name. Okay, beautiful. And all of the show notes for today will be over at thegoodlifecoach.com where you can find all of the links and the book and all of the information um, that we talked about today. What a pleasure connecting with you today. This has been a lot of fun and just, I learned so much and I know my audience has as well. Um, and you're just so lovely. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you for the vulnerability and good luck on that appointment today. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gain some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. Bye.